This week, a glimpse of the Queen's holiday home in the Scottish Highlands. I enjoy a right royal day out. I tell you what, I wouldn't mind unwinding here for a little while over the summer months. We've got a green guide for the festival season. Make sure that you've got durable camping equipment and that you take it away with you after the festival. And we uncover some of the secrets of the iconic American singer-songwriter who started a musical revolution. Just amazing to see his handwriting. Amazing. <laughs> This weekend, the UK celebrates the platinum jubilee of its longest ever reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. And whilst an enormous crowd is expected to head to Buckingham Palace to celebrate the milestone, I've made my way to a more secluded spot, 500 miles away. This is Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire, the Queen's Scottish retreat, where the royal family escape from the hustle and bustle and public scrutiny of London. That is a magnificent building. More like a big country house than a castle. Beautiful manicured lawn. I tell you what, I wouldn't mind unwinding here for a little while over the summer months. So the history is, in September 1853, Queen Victoria laid the foundation stone, and this is when they started the build of the Balmoral Castle that we have today. And in terms of the design, the architecture, what would you yes. describe it as? Again, I think Prince Albert had quite an influence. It's quite a Germanic style. It reminds him, I think, of his home in Germany. I think someone described it as a piece of Bavaria plunked into the middle of the Scottish forest land. Is exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was the start of the love affair with Balmoral. So Prince Albert and Victoria came here often? Or what? Yes, every summer, normally August, September, that's when they would come here for their summer holidays. And that tradition has remained and the royal family come here every year. These magnificent castle grounds are open to the public from spring until August when the Queen pitches up for her summer break. And every year, up to 80,000 people use that chance to pay the royal residents a visit. So we are in the ballroom. It's the largest room in the castle, and it is the only room we get access to. Tell me about the, the history of this room then. I mean, many events have happened in this ballroom. One in particular is the Gillies Ball, which was a tradition that Queen Victoria started. And it was a thank you to, again, the gamekeepers, the shopkeepers, all the staff. It's like a Scottish country dance at Cayley. And every year, and even to this day, we still have a Gillies Ball held in this ballroom. This year, for the Jubilee year, is the Salmon School designed and installed by Joseph Rosano, and it features 300 mirrored fish all hung there. The structure is also from recycled wood. It hung before at COP26, so we're very excited to have it. Which was the climate change um, conference, that's climate right, conference climate change in Glasgow. climate change conference in Glasgow. As well as marking the Jubilee, the exhibit celebrates the Royals' connection to the surrounding area. Sadly, we can't all spend our holidays on a 50,000 acre estate, but I'm now going to head out into Aberdeenshire to see how you can enjoy a royal getaway without spending a king's ransom. My first stop is Ballata, the closest village to Balmoral, on the edge of Cairngorms National Park. Now, Ballata is a cute little village with lots of guest houses and speciality shops. But there's one thing I've really noticed, which is how many places have by royal appointment hung above them. This one here as well. How 
outside here and, and a lot of the places here, it says by royal appointment to the Queen or the Prince of Wales, you've got a royal warrant. Yes. Really. What does that mean? It means we are suppliers to the royal households. You have to apply for them, but it's not just as simple as being in the village. Uh, you have to meet all the criteria that comes with that. Uh, and if you're successful in getting the royal warrant, then it's a great badge of honour. And does it also mean that the likes of Prince Charles, even the Queen, have actually been in here? They both have been in here on different occasions. But that's been a royal visit or they've came to see us specifically. Uh, they don't actually come in and shop, although one or two of the other royals do. So they come in and bought a, a joint of something, a beef or whatever? Yes, yes, they've come in and bought their favourite product. Yeah. And you charge them full price, I hope? Yes, of course. <laughs> and having shopped as the same butcher as the royal family, get me, I'm well set for the next step on my royal tour. OK, so Nick, this is the independent distillery that you use? Yeah, absolutely. So this is Lost Lock Spirit. And uh, this takes us round to the gin school, which is where we do some of the nice. research and development. I've come to this distillery, half an hour from Balmoral, to sample the estate's very own gin. So it's really important in the gin world to have a set of botanicals that has kind of relevance to where the gin's coming from. Balmoral is this, obviously, treasure trove of things that are growing there. Uh, when we started working with the team there, they had mentioned that juniper was growing on the estate, and juniper being the backbone of any gin, it was a no-brainer that we put it into the gin itself. But then there was other things that we wanted to use as well. Yep. The pine needles, as you'd expect, have a real pineiness in terms of their smell and complement the juniper. Very good. The other thing that Balmoral make is they have their own heather honey, and that's really great because it adds a little bit of a sweetness. What I would, the analogy I sometimes use is, it's a bit like strumming a guitar. Um, if one of those notes isn't quite tuned right, when you strum the guitar, it just doesn't sound right. And it's the same with the final gin product. The gin launched last year, and Nick's preparing to present the first bottle of a special Jubilee edition to Her Majesty herself. So, the Queen aside, may I suggest that the second most important sampler is yours truly. Absolutely. So, am I allowed to have a, a taste? Absolutely. So, here in the glass is the final product. So, it has got the little tanginess, the juniper I can definitely taste. Mm -hmm. The honey, actually, yes, like, it gives it a richness, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the overall thing is, actually, yes, very smooth. Now I'm um, full of Jubilee spirit. Cheers. Cheers. I'm heading to my final destination. Now this is like stepping back in time. We are in Milton of Crathus, which is the main station for the Royal Deeside Railway. For a hundred years, the Deeside Railway took the royals up to Ballater to begin their summer holidays. The royal family are greeted on their arrival at Ballater Station by the Marquis of Aberdeen before continuing on the 10-mile journey to Balmoral by car. It was decommissioned in 1966, but a small section has since been restored. A band of interested people formed a preservation society in 1996. Uh, and they've been active ever since to restore at least a piece of the original Deeside line. We operate about a mile of track. We can give you a ride on the diesel locomotive. It's a little bit noisy, sometimes bad tempered, but I'm sure you'll enjoy the ride. Whoa, look at this. This is a vintage diesel locomotive, right? Wow. I love all this actual old gritty mechanics. Now the train cab might be a world away from the luxury of Balmoral Castle, 
but this railway line is still an important part of the royal story here in Aberdeenshire and a fitting end to a grand day out. Well, now listen, if you can't make it up here to sunny Aberdeenshire, there are plenty more things you can do to enjoy a royal day out. Staying in Scotland, if you head to the capital Edinburgh, you can step aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia, which was the family's yacht for more than 40 years, taking them on almost a thousand official visits around the world. The tour takes you across five decks, and they say it's the only place you can actually see the bedroom of a living British monarch. Whilst down in London, a 15-minute walk from Buckingham Palace, nestled in the Horse Guards Parade, is the Museum of Household Cavalry. A living museum where you can watch the Queen's ceremonial guards tend to their horses. Exhibits guide you through the history of the regiment and the pomp of all their iconic uniforms. Make it there for 11 o'clock during the week to see the changing of the guard too. Or you could take a quick train ride out of London and head to the Queen's weekend home at Windsor Castle, which has a claim to being the oldest and largest occupied castle in the world. And this summer, they're holding a special exhibition looking back at the coronation ceremony that officially marked the start of her record-breaking reign. Still to come on The Travel Show. Some sustainable tips for the summer festival season. Camping equipment is for life, not just for one festival. And we're in Oklahoma for the opening of a center dedicated to the legendary singer-songwriter, Bob Dylan. I've been a fan since I was 10 years old. So stick with us. Right, now here in the UK, the summer festival season is just getting underway. And for many years, that has meant fields strewn with rubbish and abandoned tents. But we've been speaking to expert Claire O'Neill about how you can enjoy a more guilt-free, sustainable festival season in this month's Green Guide. I'm Claire O'Neill and I'm a co-founder of an organisation called A Greener Festival. If you think about a typical festival, it could be that a temporary town essentially is being built if it's a large event. So it does need to be managed quite closely to make sure that it's not having negative impacts on the environment. It also has a real opportunity for being a role model. We have a chance to go away from our normal day-to-day -day living. If you're out camping, you realise that actually electricity isn't something that's just at the flick of a switch, um, that the waste that you produce, it's actually materials. You can see the impact of consumption, essentially. There are a lot of really good examples of festivals that are doing great work for the environment. Boom Festival in Portugal, they have their own site now, so they've got the opportunity to use the funds that come in from the festival to really regenerate the land and enhance the biodiversity of the land. There's also Digital Festival, spelled DGTL, which is in Amsterdam, and they've got great ambition to be the world's first circular festival. We achieved that by artists, for example, uh, transferred by electric cars. And we've worked together with the municipality of Amsterdam to create like a green grid connection on site. And we are working together with the whole sanitation chain of the event. So we can collect all the urine and poo and we can make fertilizer and compost out of it. So we're getting all the nutrients out of it. We are reusing the water that we collect. All the five systems that we have, we create such a low impact for the whole event. It can be a lot harder for very large events to become sustainable, but they've also got a huge opportunity in the influence that they have, both in their supply chains and their industry, but also in culture and societal shifts. So for example, if Glastonbury Festival decide that from now on they're not going to have any single-use plastic bottles, then all of the caterers for the UK festival network will have found a different solution to using plastic water bottles because everybody's there. So there's hindrances, but there's also opportunities. 
festival goers are one of the most important part of the puzzle in making any event green. So one of the first things that you can do when going to a festival is look at how you're getting there. Is it going to be by some kind of low carbon means? Um, that could be public transport, it could be cycling. Many festivals are organising coach trips, for example, so look at what the festival is providing and what they're doing. And why not start the fun of the festival before you even get there with a crew of other people who are going along to the same event. The second thing that you should do is look at what you're actually taking to the festival. Make sure that you're not taking things that you don't need. There's always going to be things like catering there. There's probably even going to be some kind of fancy dress stalls there. Um, also with your camping equipment, camping equipment is for life, not just for one festival. So don't treat it as something that's disposable. Best possible thing that you can do is make sure that you've got durable camping equipment and that you pack it up and take it away with you after the festival. Then the third thing that you can do is actually speak to the festivals, speak to the artists, ask the questions in advance. If you look at what they're doing to be more sustainable, are they having vegan menus? Are they making sure that they're segregating and separating their waste or minimising it? Have they banned single-use plastics? There's many things that you can encourage festivals to do because essentially it's organised for you. <laughs> so have those conversations and try to have a positive influence. But most importantly, don't forget that it's all about having loads of fun and experiencing life in experimental and new ways. So uh, sustainability doesn't need to be a drag, it can be part of that wild journey. Okay, to wrap up this week, we're off to the United States for an encounter with musical royalty. Three, four. When you think of the rural southern state of Oklahoma, music might not be the first thing that comes to mind. But that could all be about to change with the opening of a brand new center in the city of Tulsa, dedicated to one of the world's greatest living artists, Bob Dylan. I've been very excited. I've been a fan since I was 10 years old. I'm a member of several Bob Dylan fan clubs. I am excited for everybody to come and visit the museum. I, I got a chance to see it and it's wonderful. This $10 million shrine to Dylan will be the new home to one of the largest musical archives ever acquired. One. For the Bob Dylan Center. <laughs> So the archive that we now are stewarding consists of, give or take, about 100,000 items. We have an immersive film experience that places visitors in Greenwich Village in 1963, say, or on stage during the Rolling Thunder Review Tour of the 1970s, enveloping visitors in projection and imagery and sound. From there, you go into the six songs where you can learn so much more, again, because we have these materials in the archive about, say, the writing and the recording of Like Tangled Up in Blue. Oh my gosh, look how tiny he had to write. I had no idea it would be so tiny. One might think that perhaps a center of this sort, focusing on a, a figure who's been so important to American music, might find its way to, say, a Los Angeles or New York. But Dylan commented on responding very positively to what he calls the hum of the heartland. Dylan likes the vibe of Tulsa. He's played here many times over the years. The Bob Dylan Center is just the latest opening in Tulsa's recent cultural revival, a city with a rich musical heritage. Teresa Knox is a proud Tulsan and the owner of the iconic and newly restored church studio and archive. Music has always been a big part of our city's culture, from western swing to jazz to the Tulsa sound to today. Originally opened in the 70s by the singer Leon Russell, this former place of worship has seen the likes of Eric Clapton, George Harrison, and indeed Dylan himself walking through its doors. We're just really proud to be in that cohort of historic recording studios that, you know, really honor the past but celebrate the future and inspire a new generation of musicians. 
as well as being home to a distinctive music scene, Tulsa hosts some legendary venues, none more so than Kane's Ballroom. Because we're a family owned and we've been around since 1924 and not much has really changed on the interior. And many artists have fallen in love with this unique setting. This Van Halen promo, we got pictures of them standing right over here. They got paid 500 bucks that day. This is the famous Sid Vicious punch. So the rumor is that Sid punched a hole into the wall. Here's Sid on stage, Johnny on stage. Over here is the Willie Nelson guitar, the Jack White guitar. Jack White opened his world tour here. He likes the venue so much. I think he bought a house in Tulsa because he liked this area so much. I always want to be the rock star, but uh, now I work my way up to where I make the rock stars happen now. To celebrate the opening of the Dillon Center, Keynes hosted a special series of shows with legends Patti Smith, Elvis Costello, and Mavis Staples all on the bill. I'll definitely be back. It, it took us about three and a half hours to drive here, so we can come back often. But one big question still remains. Will this great man himself visit this monument in his name? Bob Dylan is quite aware that he has an open invitation to come and visit us anytime. But don't forget, this is someone who has famously espoused a philosophy of don't look back. Wherever the tour and his muse and his instincts take him is of far more importance and interest to Dylan, but better that he's out in the world creating new songs for us to add to this collection at a later date. That's it for this week, but do join us next time when we return to the United States to explore Yellowstone Park, 150 years since it was first established. Where Lucy meets the people reintroducing America's largest land mammal, the iconic bison, back to its traditional home. Bison were gonna go extinct across North America if it wasn't for the actions that we took here in Yellowstone National Park. Should be a good one. In the meantime, you can catch up with our past adventures on the iPlayer. And what's more, if you check your screen now, you should be able to see where you can find us and a load more great travel content, all from the BBC. In the meantime, from me and the rest of the team here in Scotland, it's goodbye.